Hi, I'm Carl Wilkins from World Outside My Shoes, and I want to tell you a little bit about what happened in Rwanda after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I mean, you, you could imagine the whole country was just saturated in this thinking that says my world would be better without you in it. Well, what are you going to do with the hundreds of thousands of people who committed genocide, the ordinary citizens? Really, it's going to be the first time in history that somebody's going to try to address that issue after, well, the Holocaust, uh, modern day gen genocides. It just seemed to be overwhelming for many people. And, and really, the big goal is how do we rebuild trust? How do we change that thinking from my world would be better without you in it to my world would be better with you in it? So I want you to think for a minute about more than three, four hundred thousand people accused of killing, betraying their neighbors. The regular justice system as we know it, overwhelmed. It would take more than a hundred years. We don't have enough lawyers, you know, um, stationary. It was just that's why it's never been done before. But Rwanda basically said ordinary people did this. Crime against humanity, ordinary people can be part of the healing, the restorative process. And so I, I know this is very simplified, but Rwanda recognizes our typical form of punitive justice rarely breaks the cycle of violence. We've got, to, we've got to go farther than justice. We need to go to healing. So they'll go back to something they've been doing for hundreds of years and they'll build a model on gachacha, where you get the respected elders to help you solve a problem. Honestly, we, we also can't forget that, that we're moving from an adversarial process to a collaborative process. The government will spend close to six years restoring safety, peace, and securing the country, and then they will start to unpack the harm. You can't unpack the harm without some community support, with that safety, with that empathy. And so they will begin to, um, well, the idea is unpack the harm, develop a repair program for healing, that can break the cycle of violence, but let me tell you what they did to kind of get set up for that. Can't talk about this without talking about the leadership of President Kagame and the huge radical change he was working to bring to Rwanda to move the country away from a punitive mindset towards a more restorative mindset for people who did genocide, which is like, seemingly impossible to many of us. How are you ever going to make that, that change? And there's much to be said about his leadership and his philosophy, but I just want to highlight this one quote. You know, Africa's story has been written by others. We need to own our problems and solutions and write our own story. And that's what, what this, this story is really about. You can't just pop in, you know, plop down restorative justice. There were many things that had to be done to prepare the country and the people for it. I'll only mention two, doing away with the death penalty, as well as their constitution said a third of every decision-making group, a third of any group who had power, minimum of a third had to be women. From parliament on down to the community courts that they'll be setting up. These prisoners, they could wait for a regular trial or they could come and confess in front of the community. Usually Thursday afternoon, the soccer field, somebody brings a table out from a local school and these nine judges, at least three have to be women, these nine judges are chosen by the community. Kind of like after a genocide, maybe you have an idea who you could trust or not trust. And, and as these men and women in pink come to take responsibility, the community begins to unpack the harm, to learn the truth, to start talking together. This is not a, a formula slam dunk success formula. This is an opportunity for people to, to take that accountability and then to prepare for a, repair, um, for a repair program. It's up to the judges after confession, after community dialogue, where was my family buried or who gave away the hiding place of my children. Then the judges would decide, is this person safe to go work in the community for the repair part? or are they, they need to go back to jail, f to prison, for the repair program that happened in prison. The large majority would go on out into the community. They will have more than 12,000 of these. It's like the country is just covered with these community courts. They'll try more than 1.9 million cases.
I, um, I, I look at this thing and I think, what an enormous job to unpack the harm before the genocide, during, for generations afterwards. And can you really repair from something like that? Here's what Rwanda is going to say. The, the majority of our repair programs are going to be people coming to these camps, men and women who've confessed. I'm here with some high school kids talking to 40 men who've confessed to their role in the genocide. And they, they happen to be building roads. Other projects might be building homes or, or doing agriculture projects. This is the key word here, though, on this repair plan. It's not a payback plan. You can't pay back. You can't, you can't repair the murder or the rape of somebody, but to try to heal, I think I should probably say repair slash heal plan, but to try to heal, we've got to reinvent. Are we more than a murderer? The, the people who did the crime reinvent themselves in their minds. The people who witnessed it, the people who survived, this is a massive reinvent yourself opportunity an opportunity to safely re-enter re the community. It's like the government of Rwanda said, we can't just lock these people up for the rest of their lives. We need them back in the classroom, in the clinics, you know, where they are, farmers providing for their families. We've got to somehow get them back. We can't keep feeding them in jail and, and, and our, the families need. It was really seeing value in everybody that I think was driving this restorative model. Now, I'll wrap up with a comment of a student. She says, wait a minute, you're telling me people who did genocide get community service? That's like a slap in the wrist, on the wrist. And I'm like, I hear you. It's not fair, huh? It's, it's, it really isn't fair. Let's, let's look at our two models again. This punitive model is very transactional. We try to match the crime, the punishment with the crime, you know, these scales of justice. I, I've got to... I've got to lay down my transactional glasses and pick up glasses that believe people can change. Believe that my top priority is healing. Maybe there's times I'm ready to let go of fair in order to break the cycle of violence. That's a whole new way of looking at life, of looking at myself. I mean, I'm pretty transactional and hard on myself at times, or, or family relationships, work relationships. But this is what's got me super excited these days, is I'm asking myself, how many times am I missing transformative experiences because of my transactionally dominated thinking? Um, Rwanda will, will go on to say, you know, we need to reform our regular justice system. And, and one of the key ways they're doing that is they took those community courts that ended 2010-11 and they started forming mediation committees. You want to take somebody to prison, uh, to, to jail and uh, to court in Rwanda? You want to take somebody to court in Rwanda? You've got to first go to the mediation committee. And, and they will, they actually resolve 75%. Volunteers picked by their community, at least a third of them women. And, and that's seen unbelievable success in Rwanda. Rwanda really has just changed the way I think about so many things and I think for generations we're going to be studying their model and learning how can we become re more restorative in our thinking and in our behavior. Thanks so much.